may be seated. So Pastor Jim and Daryl are in Argentina. I think I, I should have gone on this trip. I've seen a lot of pictures. Uh, if you follow Jim on Facebook at nice restaurants, it looks like, and uh, <laughs> seem to be drinking a lot of good wine, it looks like. Um, so I think I maybe should have gone on this trip. I don't know. Um, it looks like they're having a fun time, but they're going to be back later on this week, so I'm very interested to hear about this mission trip. Um, today I'm going to be finishing up our sermon series um, on Simon Peter. If you brought your Bibles today, uh, we're going to be reading from the book of John. I must admit, I left my Bible at home. <laughs> Um, I do have the text written down on my screen, and I also didn't uh, make a slide for you guys, um, so I apologize for that, so uh, put your listening ears on. I'm going to be reading from the book of John, uh, from the New Revised Standard Version, the 21st chapter, if you're following along, verses 15 through 17. Hear these words. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So, again, I'm blessed to speak to you this morning, and we are wrapping up the sermon series on Simon Peter. And today's text finds Peter and Jesus having one of their last earthly conversations. But before we talk about the text that I just read, you guys know that I like to back up a little bit and talk about the context of the conversation. So if we back up a little bit and go back to verse 4, we find Peter and the rest of the disciples in a boat again. They're out fishing. I imagine that they're trying maybe to get back to their old lives. This is after the resurrection of Jesus, but before the ascension, before the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. I imagine that they don't know exactly what to do. They're kind of in this in-between space. They're a little bit lost. So they're out in the water. It's early morning. They're coming in, and they haven't caught any fish. And there's a man on the beach. We know that it's Jesus, but the disciples don't know that. And the light is not very good because it's early morning, and all the disciples can tell is that there's a person standing on the beach. And so the man on the beach yells out to the disciples in the boat, and he says, Children, you have no fish, have you? Seems to be like a thing with the disciples. And they answer back, <laughs> No, no. And he says to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And I would imagine that for Peter, that he must have in his mind been transported back to that first time that Jesus told him to cast your nets into the deep water. Peter had been working all night long again and had caught no fish, and he had invited Jesus into the boat. And reluctantly, but obediently, he said, If you say so, Jesus, I will do it. And he cast his net into the water, and he hauled in all of these fish, and that was it. Peter was all in with Jesus. He dropped his nets, he dropped his old life, and he followed Jesus. So when they cast their nets out to the right side of the boat and they hauled in all of these fish, Peter and the disciples must have known 
who that man was on the beach. It was Jesus. And impulsive Peter jumps in the water. He jumps in the water and swims to the shore. No hesitation. He has to see Jesus. The rest of the disciples, they row the boat to shore, dragging the net full of fish beside, uh, along beside them, and Jesus invites them to sit down and have breakfast. Now the scripture tells us that this is the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after the, after the resurrection. So I imagine Jesus and the disciples sitting on the beach, and I wonder, was it... Was, were they all talking and excited, or was it quiet? The introvert in me thinks they must have all been sitting there kind of wanting to say things to Jesus, but not. Because, because what do you say? What do you say to Jesus? What do you say to the resurrected Jesus who's sitting with you there on the beach after everything that has happened? And that's where we pick up the scripture that I read. Jesus and the disciples sitting there eating breakfast. And Jesus turns and he looks at Peter. And Peter knows that they have some unfinished business. I imagine that Peter is thinking about how he denied Jesus. How he says, I don't know this man. And how he did it three times. All four of the Gospels tell this story of Peter denying Jesus, and three of the four tell how Peter ran away and how he wept bitterly over doing that. And that was the last that we saw of Peter until resurrection morning when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and does not find Jesus' body there and then tells the disciples that Jesus, Jesus is not there. But I'm sure that this guilt that Peter must be caring for what he has done is just eating him alive. And so Peter and Jesus get up and they walk along the beach. N.T. Wright in his commentary says, this scene between Jesus and Peter is one of the most spectacular interchanges in the whole Bible, perhaps in all of literature. The most remarkable thing about it is that by way of forgiveness, Jesus gives Peter a job to do. When Peter professes his love, Jesus doesn't say, well, that's all right then. He says, well then, feed my lambs. Look after my sheep. Feed my sheep. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell each and every one of us to do in our lives. I imagine that Jesus is walking down the beach with each of us, quietly talking to us about the junk that we're carrying around in our lives. Some of us have things we need to ask for forgiveness for. Some of us have guilt that we carry around in our lives. Some of us are afraid, afraid that we'll lose power, Afraid that we'll lose something important to us. Afraid that we'll lose some type of control. Some of us allow other people to put labels on us and then allow those labels to define us. Some of us are walking around carrying loads of baggage with us. All of these things, the forgiveness we are withholding, the guilt that we carry, the labels we let others put on us or that we put on ourselves, the fear that we let lead our lives, the baggage that we carry are keeping us from being in a full relationship with Jesus. We need to let go of these things. We need to drop them on the beach because as long as we're carrying this stuff, we're not free. We're not free to go into the world and do the thing that we were created to do. You see, Jesus was all about love. Jesus came to show us and to teach it, teach us what it looks like when we drop all the baggage that we're carrying and just love. Jesus showed us this by his actions. He showed us this by doing exactly the opposite of what people thought he should be doing. 
He was always doing things that people thought was not the right things. He was eating with people he shouldn't eat with. He was eating with sinners. He was hanging out with women. He was talking to women. He was telling weird stories. He was telling stories about the good Samaritan. Jesus came to wield a new type of power, the power of love. So often in this world, we get caught up in so many things. We get caught up in guilt, like the guilt Peter had for the things that he had done. We need to learn how to ask for forgiveness, and we need to learn how to accept forgiveness, and we need to learn how to let things go. For a long time as a mother, I used to carry around the guilt for the mistakes that I had made. We all make mistakes. I feel like I probably made more mistakes when the girls were little, um, but I still make mistakes now that they're older. There was at a time when Emily was in pre-K-4, and I forgot it was pajama day, and she was the only kid in the class in her regular school clothes. Or the time I forgot to pick her up from school. That was not my best moment. Or the time when I was trimming baby Bailey's fingernails in clipped off the end of her actual finger. That was really bad. I felt real bad for that for a long time. Or that time I became so angry at teenage Bailey that I said words to her that I should not have ever said. Mistakes that I made as a mother. Mistakes that I had to ask forgiveness for, but then things that I had to let go of because they were in the past. And holding on to that guilt would have only kept me from moving forward on my path. But guilt and forgiveness are not the only things that we carry. We also carry around the need for power, a type of power that has nothing to do with love. We get caught up in a type of power that means control, and the idea of this loss of power leads to fear. But this way is not the way of Jesus. Often when it comes to this type of power situation, labels get placed on people, and labels can often keep us from moving forward. I wonder if Peter felt this way. I wonder if the disciples placed labels on Peter. I wonder if any of them saw Peter's denial of Jesus as a chance to say something cruel about Peter or to say that he was less than. I wonder if Peter was afraid of losing his place in the group. I wonder if Peter walked around in fear thinking he'd lost his place in the world. I wonder if the other disciples dealt with this. I'm sure they were afraid because the crowds who had crucified Jesus clearly had put labels on Jesus, and I am sure put those same labels on the disciples. The Christian community has not exactly done a good job of not putting labels on people. Even today, we struggle with the idea that we are all as in all humanity, worthy of God's love. We put labels on people and we try to hold on to power because we are afraid. We tell people that they are less than. As a woman in ministry on Mother's Day, I cannot let this day go by without mentioning the, woman, the labels that women carry in church. Labels that say they may not speak or that they should be quiet. Labels that say that others are more important than them. Labels that say they are not created equal. Labels that say they must stay in harmful situations. Or labels that say that others can treat them as less than. Labels that we carry around about our place and about the things that we can do and accomplish Labels that accidentally get stuck on the next generation of women, on little girls who watch from the sides. This week, there was a disappointing, disappointing vote from the United Methodist Church. There was the inability to vote in language into our Constitution that both men and women 
are made in the image of God and that we as a church will all pledge to seek to eliminate discrimination against women and girls, that language failed. Now, in the last few days, information has come out that there was excessive language in the ballot that should not have been there, and a revote will take place, but the damage has already been done. Labels have been stuck on people. Cheers have rose up from some that this was a good thing, that it was good that this language was not included. Arguments have been made on why we do not need to affirm women and girls in our Constitution, and hurtful rhetoric has ruled the day. A second amendment, Amendment 2, which would have added language, nor shall any member be denied access to an equal place in the life, worship, and government, governance of the church. Life, worship, and governance of the church based on race, color, gender, nation of, or, nation of origin, ability, age, or marital status, or economic condition also failed. Again, labels to stick on people. You are too old, too young, not the right color, not the right gender. You don't come from the right place. You don't have enough money to be part of this church, to worship here, or to be a leader. Those are labels that do harm. Those are labels that keep us from moving forward. Those are labels that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. That is wrong. These are labels we need to stop sticking on people. And the same thing is going to happen as we move forward with the way forward. As the United Methodist Church tries to decide what to do with the issue of ordination and marriage of those in the LGBTQ community. And as we sit in all of this and argue about who is and who is not created in the image of God, and we argue about who is worthy and who is not worthy, as we argue about who is a sinner and who is not a sinner, about who deserves and who does not deserve something, as we sit in this baggage on the beach, the whole world is out there who needs Jesus. And I feel like Jesus, I feel like Jesus is standing there on the beach looking at us as we insist on sitting there with our guilt and our inability to forgive, as we insist, insist on sitting there with our illusion of power, as we insist on sitting there saying we are better than somebody, as we insist on sitting there putting our labels in, on each other, as we insist on sitting there not moving and Jesus just wants us to walk down the beach, and Jesus just wants to ask us one thing. Do you love me? And if the answer is yes, then Jesus has something for us to do, to go out into the world and to love his sheep, to love our neighbors as Jesus loves them unconditionally. We are free from the stuff that we carry around by Jesus Christ, just like Peter was free. Jesus frees us. And that freedom allows us to go into the world to be the light of God. We must stop sitting on the beach. We must stand up and we must accept God's grace. And we must boldly love God and love our neighbors. We must put the past in the past and stop putting these labels on each other. We must boldly go in the world to bear the image of God to each other and show the world that all all humanity, men, women, little girls and little boys, all races, colors, genders, nations, nations of origins, abilities, ages, marital statuses, economic conditions, all people, all people are created in the image of Almighty God, equal and worthy, equal and worthy, and able to do great things for the kingdom of God. So let's stop sitting on the beach and let's get busy. Amen.